morning, everybody, and welcome to this episode of 30 Minutes to President's Club. My name is Armand Farouk, and I'm here with my co-host, Nick Sigelski. And today, we have another person as part of the Webflow family tree of unbelievable sellers. It is Spencer Ivey, Enterprise Account Executive over at Webflow. Nick, why should people listen? Spencer has a really awesome perspective on wearing your business case hat at all times and starting to formulate your business case literally on the first discovery call. And then not just building your business case in secret in the shadows, actually surfacing that to your prospects so they see the work that you're doing and so you can co-create things. And then he talks about how that trickles down into what he shows and does in the demo and how that impacts how he negotiates a longer term strategic deal rather than a very short deal that doesn't impact his commission check as much. It's not a three-year deal. It's not a two-year deal. It's not a one-year deal. Folks, it's an episode of 30 Minutes to President's Club. Let's ride. All right, Spencer, welcome to the show. We start every single episode with your top three actionable takeaways. So let's get your three. Number one, re-engage prospects with an idea. So this is a great tactic to use mid-cycle to re regain momentum in your deal. Instead of just the standard, hey, just following up, you can really intrigue and pull your prospects in by telling them that you have an idea you want to share with them. So what that sounds like is typical, I'll send an email that just says, hey, I was out on a walk, had a quick idea that I wanted to run by you. Do you have 15 minutes later today? Usually that's enough to get people back in the line. And when you get those folks back in the line, have a very crisp suggestion on what you want to do as a next step. Beautiful. What's number two? Number two is your nurture list. So very simple tactic to keep track of anyone who has shown really any level of interest in your product. Make sure you are staying top of mind, even when you're not in an active buying cycle. So anytime I get any level of engagement with a prospect that stalls out for whatever reason, whether it's an email reply that doesn't go anywhere, maybe a meeting where they didn't move into a buying cycle, or maybe even people that I've run full cycles with and they didn't buy, I will keep track of all those folks by tagging them in my CRM with the word nurture, maybe use an open text field that you have access to, and then you can run reports based on that field. If you don't have that, then you can just very easily use an Excel spreadsheet. And then what I'll do is I'll run that report on a monthly basis and reach back out to those folks with a little bit of value and no ask. So send them an ebook, invite them to an event, let them know about a new product feature, this just really helps me stay top of mind and builds a goodwill from when the time is right to get back into a cycle. Amazing. Round us out. What's number three? Cool. Number three is wearing your business case hat at all times, especially during a demo scenario. So what I'll do is on a demo, after demonstrating a feature that resonated, you could ask, hey, if you had to defend the value of this feature to your team, how would you do it? Usually you can get some good insights from that. Additionally, one good thing to do is to actually show a slide where you propose the three most common areas where your customers are actually finding business value in your solution. Usually that's some derivation of lower costs, increased efficiency, increased revenue, lower risk. Ideally, you can also have a customer story that is associated each one of those things that you can use to show social proof. And then from there, you can really ask, hey, based on what you know about your business, which one of these resonates with you the most or which one of these would your leadership team get most excited about? Spencer, much of the ability to call these things out in a demo relies on what you got in discovery. Talk to me throughout discovery, at the end of discovery, what are the things that you're listening for? And then how do you attach that to what you show inside of a demo? Some of the things that I'm looking for in discovery is anytime folks are kind of calling out areas where I know my solution can help. So again, knowing where you drive business value, you can continue to ask some of those leading questions um, throughout the discovery phase. So for us at Webflow, it's usually about moving to market faster. So if I can dig into how long is that, how long is something taking you today? And having some of those actionable metrics, I can continue to bring that back up as I am talking through the demonstration and maybe continue to dig deeper. So it's perhaps a little bit around asking some leading questions around discovery, and then making sure you note that and then bring it back during the demonstration process or in future calls. So Spencer, let's say that someone says, you know, it's taking me a lot of time 
to update this page on my website, or it takes me forever every time I want to add a new SKU on my e-commerce platform. How do you go about taking that from a high level pain point into a more quantifiable impact? I would say the biggest thing is, is know what your customers have accomplished before. And so being able to take that little nugget, let's say, Hey, it took me six hours to create this page. Well, for our customer Acme Co, because they were able to cut down on the time it took them, it actually ended up reducing their engineering costs. Tell me a little bit more about the engineering team that supports getting these pages up today. It almost gives you an area to dig into other areas and prompt people with specific things that you've seen in uh, other cycles with your customers and the outcomes that they've driven before. That is a substantially better way to do it than to ask, well, how much time could you save if you could update your websites faster? Is a lot of times people will lead folks into these cringy sales traps or these cringy impact questions where they're trying to get you to say that your website takes a long time to update. And then they try to bring you through a live math equation, which is just extremely excruciatingly painful. And oftentimes your prospects don't even have the answers to those things. But what you did instead is you said, awesome. Typically when someone is experiencing pain around this type of thing, we know that that usually means it takes this much engineering time. And so you can actually spell out the case for themselves because you know the answer to those things, and then you can have them validate those things. The only other thing that I wanna call out that Spencer is doing here is you're right, you are showing them the path that they need to follow because you have thought through the, okay, here's actually what is going into this problem. We need to know about the team that is causing this problem, but I know we need to ask about that. And so you just point them where we need the information and get it from them rather than asking an extremely leading cringy question about metrics that doesn't actually help them get a better understanding of the problem. That's actually what you're doing. So Spencer, before we jump over to demo, let's say you do this two or three times. It's like, okay, we know that this takes this much engineering time. We know that there's another pain point over here. Talk to me about how you wrap up this discovery call and sort of how that sets up the demo. I think coming back to this concept of wearing your business case hat at all times, I think you can be very transparent about what you're trying to lead your prospects to. Instead of hiding and trying to put something together behind their back, just very transparently say, hey, the reason I'm asking a lot of these questions and why it's great that I've gotten some of this intel from you today is because I imagine a point, if you continue to like what Webflow has to offer, that you're going to have to put a case together for your superiors or to get budget approval. So what I'd like to do in future conversations is continue to come back to this concept. And if it's okay with you, at some point, what I imagine us doing is actually putting together a document that spells out what the business case would be. If you have a template that you use for that, great. If you don't, I'd be happy to guide you through what some of my other customers have done. So I think it's really just about being transparent about where you're going to take this and why some of this information is important to continue gathering and set the expectation that you will continue to do so. So you're at the end of the discovery call and what you're doing is really smart here, which is the effort that you are putting into the deal. You're not doing it behind closed doors. You're making it public and apparent to the customer. You're probably starting to build a business case regardless behind the scenes, but you're actually pulling it out of the shadows and showing them, hey, I'm working on this thing. On the discovery call, are you like, hey, I wanna send you over my initial POV, I'm gonna send you what I've put together, or are you just planting the seed that this thing is gonna happen? I guess I'm curious how much back and forth happens with you and the customer, knowing that they haven't even seen a demo yet. I think at this point, especially for the cycles that, that I run here, it's more of a strategic long-term play, so I'm not, necessarily going to send a succinct POV right then and there. However, what I will do is start to plant some of those seeds to your point. I will perhaps call it out in a follow-up email. Hey, we covered these points. Maybe it's taking a long time to spin up these pages or hey, you're spending a lot of engineering time to get those pages created. Let's continue to dig into that in future conversations. So it's much more about planting the seed and of course, it kind of depends on what you get out of that discovery conversation and how deep you go. But in general, yes, it's more about planting those seeds to then come back to it and be a little bit more specific in future conversations. Well, a lot of people think that because you need to get business impact and discovery, that literally means you need to go through the full ROI equation 
in a discovery call. And that is far from the case. When I was at PAVE, I was selling compensation software. And a lot of times the goal was to get someone to say, okay, we've lost a few employees, or we are generally struggling with winning candidates. But I usually couldn't get all the retention metrics. What I did is I got the stories that showed me the inputs to the business case in the future. And then you use the demo to firm those things up and make it real. And then you put actual numbers behind it on that third call in the business case call itself. Great. So let's actually go fast forward to that demo, Spencer. So you finish your discovery call. You have a general sense of what might go into that. Take me to the demo and let's start with like actually how you kick it off, how you set the stage, sort of take me through blow by blow in terms of how you run your demos, knowing that this business case hat is something that we are still wearing. I will typically start demos by setting an agenda. And usually the three key items will be, number one, let's recap what we talked about last time. Let's make sure we heard you. And typically in that recap, I will put in a couple of nuggets that I've learned from that first discovery conversation on where some of that business value could lie. Can I ask you what a recap might sound like? Recap might sound like we'll have a slide that is t literally, here's what we heard. And then beneath that, probably four or five bullets on some of the key concepts from the last conversation. So going along with this theme of how, how long it took to create a certain web page and how much engineering time it took, perhaps I will call that out in the bullet points in that recap and give us that opportunity to perhaps ask some deeper level questions there. The second piece with the demo is setting the stage that we will have a little bit of time to actually talk about where other customers have seen impact. Because to the point we were talking about earlier, typically as the rep, you know where you need to take the conversation, but customers oftentimes do not. So giving them those three or four areas, having this on one slide, here are the three or four areas where we drive business value. And by the way, here is where customers have seen impact in these areas. And then having the opportunity to ask deeper questions. Setting the stage that we're going to do that is often a very important part uh, of a demonstration, especially up front, so that moving into the third stage, when you actually do the demo, you have some of these pieces that you can pull back into. For example, let's say we learned during talking about these business drivers that one of the key pieces is we want to drive revenue. Okay, well, because we talked about driving revenue with this feature, we're going to be able to enable your team to move a lot faster, which means they're gonna get more campaigns out the door, which means more lead flow, right? So making sure that you have those things that you can relay your demonstration back to, because it's not just like a generic, hey, here's this cool feature. It's actually, hey, here's this cool feature. By the way, this is how companies can help tie the, the product back to this business value. The thing that's oftentimes helpful for me to think about is doing everything in sets of threes. So you find three problems, you recap three problems, you show three problems, and that's how you attach the discovery to the app, to the demo. Spencer, talk to me about how do you go about showing a feature and making it not this long 50 minute monologue around all of the clicks and yada, yada, yada. What is a way to demo one part or one flow within your product? Sure. Well, in full transparency for us at Webflow, we have um, solutions engineers who often drive the primary demoing of the product. So the way I think about this is when I have my solutions engineer demoing a, a certain part of the product, I will often jump in when I notice some sort of engagement from the audience. I'll be looking at people's video screens. If I get a raised eyebrow, if I get people nodding their heads, I might jump in and say, hey, why don't we pause here for a moment? I noticed that that seemed to be of interest to you. How are you en envisioning this could help your team? So I think demoing is as much getting feedback and getting people to envision what the feature is going to do for their team as it is actually showing the product. So I'll make sure to have those moments and look for that engagement to then jump in, kind of break the flow and get feedback from the customer and get them to think about, okay, if we did have this, here's how, I would, how I'd, I would envision the impact coming to life. That's awesome. I mean, and to your point, Spencer, 
This is something that I learned when I worked with a solutions consultant who would actually show the product. If you're an AE and you're on a demo and you're just answering other emails and not really paying attention, you're missing a really, really big opportunity. Because if you think about the job of your solutions consultant, they have to know their demo flow. They have to know what screens they need to move through. They need to make sure that they're following the talk track as they explain things. And so it's really, really hard when you're showing a demo as a solutions consultant to be watching the group and seeing what's resonating versus what's confusing people. And to also think about, okay, how do I attach this to the notes that I got from Spencer about the discovery call? So it is your responsibility as the AE to be working the room and connecting the dots. If they show a feature and don't explain how that ties to the problem that was uncovered in discovery, you have to call it out. And then the other thing you're doing that's really smart is instead of pausing and being like, oh, I saw that resonated, any questions about it, you're asking a question of, hey, how do you envision using this? Which now when they actually speak out loud, here's how we would do this, they're taking ownership of the platform you're showing which now they almost feel like they're using it. Are there other questions you're asking or things that you're doing during this demo to get more engagement out of the group that you're in front of? I feel like this is one of the, the hardest things to do as an AE, especially when you have someone else that's like taking the floor for the majority of the meeting. You want to make sure that you're continuing to stay involved and almost like break the flow of the conversation. If you have one person talking for like 20 minutes showing a feature, it can be, it can put folks to sleep. So yeah, I think maybe other questions you could ask, you know, one thing that's important at Webflow is we often drive value with a number of different teams that might be working together, but a lot of times are somewhat separate. So when you show a certain piece of, of your product, you could ask something like, how would you envision this workflow impacting this other team. And now all of a sudden you're getting folks to think about the impact of this solution outside of just their immediate workflow. And that gives you not only intel into how the organization might think about implementing your product, but also gives you a sense of where you need to multi-thread. Maybe it gives you a sense of conversations that you need to have with other people in order to effectively put forward a, a solid case of getting your product actually purchased. The difference between the two types of questions that you just asked is the first question you asked was, you mentioned this was a problem. How do you see this solving that problem, essentially? The question that you just asked was, hey, let's just pretend you were using this tomorrow. How could you see your team rolling this out? Or how could you see it in their hands? The past questions are oftentimes what you use at the beginning of a demo, where you're trying to validate the problems that they said that they had. The future actions are once you've proven that you've solved the problems, you say, hey, let's pretend that you're solving this problem with us. How do we make this thing fit like a glove? Where most sellers screw up, they spend way too much of their time in present questions. So they'll demo a dashboard and they'll ask, how do you do this today? Sometimes that's necessary to be able to demo the feature accurately, but you should spend most of your time in past questions, validating problems and future questions where you make them see the vision of how they could be using your product in the future. So Spencer, I want to move to, let's assume discovery went well, demo went well, we're moving now towards the back piece of the sales cycle. And so this is where we might be really fleshing out that business case. This might be where we're starting to negotiate the deal you're doing some really intentional things as it relates to positioning for the negotiation. And I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about what you are doing. I think first, first thing when you're entering negotiation that I'd like to do is to start with your longest term deal. This gives you a stronger leg to stand on throughout the negotiation. If you start with, let's say, three-year deal is your longest term deal, and then someone comes in and asks for a discount. At that point, you then have more levers to pull to either stand strong on price or mess around with other deal terms. Spencer, I, I want to ask you a different question, which is, okay, it's finally time to present deal terms to the customer. And I want to hear how you voice that over, because I think that will make it more real for the listener than what you want to do. So Spencer, I want to go to the point in the deal when it is time for you to start to present some deal terms where you might give them stuff around pricing and skews that they're going to get in terms of what you deliver and deal length, et cetera. Talk to me about how you explain and position deal terms to the prospect. 
So I get on a meeting, I'm your prospect, and it's time to have that conversation. What are some of the key points you're communicating and how do you voice those over? I think the biggest thing is is delivering the pricing succinctly and with confidence. And typically doing that with a single slide that summarizes everything. So let's say that you've gotten to a point where you have a good idea of what the customer needs and what type of plan you're going to be proposing to them. Ideally, um, start with the very simple bullet points on a single slide. Mention the exact pricing in a very straightforward way. It's going to be a three-year commitment or it's going to be your longest term commitment. And then from there, shut up. Let silence do the talking for you and show that you are confident in what you are putting forward and make sure that you're not over explaining, jump in and over explain pricing and really try to put a lot of rationale behind it. So I think starting out when you're first explaining deal terms with simplicity and with confidence and with as short of amount of time as you can possibly do, I think then puts you in a very strong position for the rest of the conversation. Customer pushes back on three years. They say, whoa, three years, like that's a pretty big commitment. Seems like a lot of time. How do you respond? How do you protect your deal term or deal length integrity in that scenario? Or do you fold and say, hey, actually, we can change that? Sometimes what I'll do with really any sort of pricing pushback is nod my head and acknowledge it and say, okay, and then just leave it there and see what happens. So many times I have found that people will actually jump back in and offer you additional rationalization. They'll offer you reasons why they might even start to walk it back. I've had this happen before where a procurement person was like, no, we need a 20% discount or we cannot move forward. And then they started to actually walk that back. And they said, well, you know, we could make it work and we could do this and that. And they offered a few other things. So again, coming back to like not negotiating against yourself, sometimes what I've found is the best thing to do is actually just to not address it immediately. Say, okay, allow for a little bit of silence and see if they fill in with a little bit of reasoning. This is so bad, but when I'm buying things, whenever someone gives me price, I don't turn my camera on half the time. <laughs> and then the second part is the moment they give me price, I go on mute. I literally go on mute and I just wait. And they'll be like, it's $20,000 or it's $50,000. But you know, we can always work on price and da -da -da -da. and it's, you can see them caving because people are so uncomfortable with the silence. But folks, you have to remember, procurement people, their job is to buy things. In other words, they're being brought things that your prospect wants to buy. And so if they do so badly in a negotiation that they lose the deal entirely, they're actually not doing their job first. But Spencer, naturally, a more savvy procurement person might say, I want a discount and you're just waiting. You go, okay. And I might look at you and be like, so you're going to do something about that? Or are you just going to have a staring contest? <laughs> what do you do from there? As much as a stare down is a ton of fun. I think at some point, yes, if you've got a savvy procurement person on the line, you might have to break the silence in some way. So in that scenario, typically what a lot of procurement pe people are trying to do is they're trying to pick apart your terms one at a time. So they'll ask for a discount, you'll cave on the discount. And then they'll go, oh, actually, well, we also need net 90 terms. And then you'll give them net 90 terms and they're gonna say, oh, well, actually we need a two-year commitment instead of a three-year commitment, right? And they'll try to break you apart piece by piece. So to combat that, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll say, okay, I hear that you're looking for a discount. Assuming we gave that to you what else would you need in order to move forward with the proposal? That way, instead of getting everything piecemeal and you caving on something one by one, and then all of a sudden you've got a really bad looking deal on the table that you have to go sell your finance team, you can actually get everything on the table at once. And then if people push back on that, the rationale that I would give behind that is, hey, I understand that you're in charge of selling this internally to your team to get this over the line, I'm actually in the same position on my end. Once I understand what you need, I need to go sell this to my team internally. So in order to help you get what you need, it'd be great to understand what pieces you need on the table in order to formally move forward. I really love your positioning there of saying, hey, you and I have the exact same job because 
it actually forces them to have a little bit of empathy. They're sitting there being like, all right, they have a team who's putting pressure on them to whittle you down and get the best possible terms. And when you show them that you're doing the same thing and that you only have one shot, it makes it really hard for them to then pepper you again in the future because you've shown I'm doing the same thing as you. And you've set that expectation. So customer says, yep, here's the four things that we need. And that's everything. If we get those four things, we're good. Can you talk to me about what that looks like? So once you have everything out on the table, it makes a lot of sense to understand where you're going to go next with your prospect. Usually I'll say something like, okay, great. Understand you need X, Y, Z in order to move forward. Let's assume that we are able to get that over to you and send you a formal contract. What comes next on your end? And what you're looking for here is making sure that there's not going to be then another 10 people that this needs to go through, because if that is then the case, then you know that you actually might want to push for some additional conversations with other stakeholders before you formally promise anything. Maybe someone's like, oh, well, this also needs to go through approval with Johnny. Okay. It sounds like Johnny perhaps has a stake in this conversation. Would it make sense so we're not having too much back and forth to go talk to them first and just make sure we're all on the same page? So you're looking for some of the things that might derail you and also just to gut check yourself that maybe this deal isn't done. Maybe there are other things that I need to look into and have a clear sense of, you know, this actually getting to be a done deal after promising all these terms. That's really good. That will save you a massive amount of time and headache because there is nothing more frustrating than going back and forth and back and forth with who you think is your buyer only to find out deal terms approved, but now you have three other presentations to a skeptical Johnny and now your deal gets monkeyed with further and your boss is upset because your team's forecast got screwed up. So that's really, really smart asking them to tell the future if you are able to provide those things. Now, unfortunately, I have to tell the future, which is we're running out of time, Spencer. And so we got to move to the final question before we run out of time in my hourglass. And the final question is this. We've talked about a lot of really great things salespeople should be doing. Now I got to ask you about a shouldn't. What is one bad habit that you see a lot of salespeople exhibiting that you think they need to break because it hurts them more than it helps? Yeah, I think a bad habit that I've had in the past is assuming that the only direction is forward. So at the end of every call, I often give folks the opportunity to opt out. Hey, are we ready to move to the next step, whatever it is that you suggested, or are we not quite there yet? And by giving those folks the opportunity to opt out, they often opt in. Amazing. Spencer, thank you for joining us. It is time for your two by two recap email from this episode with Spencer Ivy. Number one is when your solutions engineer or solutions consultant is showing a demo, that is not your time to catch up on email and eat lunch. You need to be playing DJ and calling out when they show a feature, how it connects to something you learned in discovery. Or when they show something and you see someone look confused on your prospects end, you need to call it out and make sure there's a discussion to clarify things. It is too much work to put onto your SC to be the one watching the room and showing the demo. Number two is if you're working on a business case, make your effort visible to your prospect and let them know. Don't work alone in the shadows. Show your prospect the hard work you're doing on the deal and it will buy you spades in reciprocity. Number three, you want to gather those inputs to your business case in discovery, but you don't have to build the whole business case right there. You'll make it real in demo, and then you'll put numbers behind it in the final business case meeting. And then lastly, number four, I just want to be quiet right now because the takeaway is when someone asks for a discount, be quiet. All righty, Nick, how can people help us out here? So folks, Spencer has some really awesome stuff around getting all the asks on the table before negotiating and playing forward the future. 30MPC actually put together a full guide to nailing your B2B negotiations. And if you'd like that guide, it's free. There's a link in the show notes. It'll take you to the 30MPC newsletter. Folks who are subscribed to that newsletter get it before anyone else, which means they negotiate better than anyone else. You can get it now, though. Go check it out, and we'll see you next week on the show. 